everybody. Hey, how are you doing? I said, how are you doing? Woo! Are you guys getting your con voice on like I am? Fantastic. Uh, you guys been enjoying your time here at Nerd HQ? Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much. Uh, you guys ready to watch a cool little trailer for Intruders? Let's go ahead and roll that. You've not been yourself. Sorry, honey. I guess the music just took me away. That this book is in your hands proves death is not a punishment. We do die, but we can return. We're just here to shepherd you. Amy, where are you? This life is ours. It is not theirs. People like us have a responsibility, don't we? Hey, sweetie, can you keep a secret? In the beginning, there was death. What goes around? comes around. Yeah! It's, it's one of the creepiest little girls I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, hey, a uh, few house rules. Do we know, is there any flash photography allowed of this panel? No! Is there any video allowed of this panel? Is there any fun allowed of this panel? Yes, there is! Uh, hey, you guys raised roughly $3,500 for Operation Smile, so give yourselves a round of applause for that. This is my kind of moment where I dance monkey dance while I'm vamping while we put some chairs up. Anybody have any questions for me? You want to just shout it out? Yes, I'm married. So, <laughs> ladies. Uh, any, any questions? I will be doing Smiles for Smiles both today and tomorrow. As soon as I can carve out moments... I will be there. I, uh, I wish I could clone myself so I could do this and that, uh, but I'm still waiting on the technology, TikTok. Uh, I think, are we all ready to rock? We are all ready to rock. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, John Sim, Mira Sorvino, James Frain, and Glenn Morgan. And all the way around, and all the way around. Keep it going. Oh, you want a little selfie action, don't you? Over the table and through the woods. Oh, you you have the power. Do anything on my own. Um, we want to do a selfie with you guys in the background. And so what, we're going to go here and turn our backs on you, and you're going to freak out. And then. We... But like a proper freak out. Let's not hold back, kids. The selfie has just taken over the world. That's basically what's happened. Thank God that's out of the way. Uh, so the, I've instructed these guys uh, what's going on. You guys know the drill. So who has questions? Who's got those burning questions? Just raise your hand and get a microphone. Uh, oh, nice socks. <laughs> oh, does everyone just want to take pictures and not ask questions? <laughs> what are you doing in Nerd HQ? No, but somebody must have a question. Yes, you have a question. Thank you, darling. Way to start us off. Hi, this is a question for Miss Servino. I love your father. He's one of my favorite actors. What, um, which one of his works most influenced you and how you act? Because you guys have the same um, beautiful method in your eyes. I can, I can always tell what you guys are emoting right away, and I feel it right away. So I just wanted to know what of his did you take away? Thank you. Uh, well, the, the, when I was a kid, the most influential role he played was in something called Dummy, which was a television movie about a deaf lawyer based on a, a true story about a real deaf lo lawyer named Lowell Myers who defends a deaf and dumb kid played by LeVar Burton who's accused of rape and murder, and he's innocent. 
And, uh, and my father worked with deaf children. He went to the Lexington School for the Deaf to learn the different stages of deaf speech because his character becomes profoundly deaf at 12, but the story spans 20 years. So the older you get when you're deaf, the more you lose certain consonants and plosives and things like that. So I was so in awe of the amount of work he did for it and the sort of nobility of it. Like he was really honoring the people that he was playing. And then when you see the movie, it's just kind of a great piece of work. And it's hard to find now because it was, you know, a tele television movie from, I, I don't know, it was the early 80s, I think. Um, but uh, the crazy part is he gives this masterful speech to the, to the jury, right? His, you know, his big final closing remarks. And I said, Dad, that is just such an incredible piece of acting. How many takes did you do? And he said, one. <laughs> so that was it. Mayor, uh, uh, over here, over here. Um, <laughs> Uh, growing up in and around the business, w was it? Did you initially have like a response of like I don't want to be an actor, or was your initial response like I love this, I love seeing this, I love being around it, I want to continue in these type of footsteps? You know, it, I enjoyed being around it. Like Dad would have us come to the set, and other actors that he worked with would carry me on their shoulders, and it would be a fun visit. I also really loved doing plays in school. But I didn't equate necessarily that they were the same thing until I was older. So when I was a little kid, it was just like, I, oh, being in the school play is fun, and oh, visiting dad on the set of his sitcom is fun. But uh, it was only when I was a little bit older that I started thinking I wanted to do it professionally. But I also wanted to be an astronaut and, and an anthropologist. So <laughs> I think I stopped at the A's. <laughs> <laughs> so no butchers, no barbers, nothing like that. Uh, who's got the next question? Right. Oh, do you have a microphone? Who's got a? Oh, right over there. Right over there. On the Hi. right. Hi. Nice to see you all. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about the little girl in the show. That trailer with her is amazing. What was it like, kind of casting a little girl to get, have those qualities? And if any of you guys have worked with her, what you thought about it? Well, they can talk about working with her, but uh, a part like that, and basically she is sort of uh, possessed, so to speak, by kind of Joe Pesci in a way, like a. a <laughs> a 7, 65, 70 year old man who has done some horrible things. And I'm like, we're never, yeah, this is like a secret I had. I'm like, we're never gonna do this show because we'll never find this kid. If you're a movie, you know, you can audition 500, 1,000 kids. And I'm like, okay. So uh, Julie Gardner at BBC Worldwide says, check your email, there's an audition tape and we wanna make this girl an offer. And I thought, they don't know what they're doing. They, the first kid? And I, I open up the email, and there's this face with like yellow Ray-Bans that her dad had done on an iPhone or something. And <laughs> I, I thought it was a joke. I, I mean, she's just extraordinary. And I thought, uh, this is a joke. The first kid? And she's incredible. And so she came in to audition in person, and um, she's talking to us with an American accent. I had no idea she was British. And so she stops the audition and starts talking. I'm like, no, you don't have to do a British accent because we're at BBC. She's like, no, I'm British, you know? <laughs> so you got the job, you know? So I think these guys can talk about what it's like to uh, work with her. She was wonderful to work with. She was a breath of fresh air. She was, every time we saw her on set, she was just, she's just wonderful. And, and you'll see, you'll see her performance when it comes out. But to work with her was nothing but joy. She was, she was fabulous. She would act with these guys. She's never, you know, she played a uh, little Alice in um, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, two episodes, never in a school play, you know, never played Mrs. Claus in the pageant. And um, she's just there with these guys. And then at lunch, she worked in the catering truck. <laughs> you, you know, there, your lunch. So, I mean, she, we couldn't uh, say enough nice things about her. I did a, a scene with her once. Um, where I'm about to shoot her, I'm trying to shoot her. I mean, you did that. Spoiler. She wouldn't listen. <laughs> what do you expect? Anyway, and um, we did about two or three takes of it. I had my close up. And then we finished, she came up to us. And after she went, nice one, James. <laughs> I was like, well, thank you very much. She's, she's pretty outstanding. She's a real special kid. What, what is her name, by the way? Millie Brown. Oh, okay. Well done, Millie Brown. We just kept calling her she, and I was like, well, I guess we'll just keep doing that. Uh, um, who's got the next question? Oh, you have a microphone. Yes, please stand up. Hi. Um, first of all, you guys are all 
so amazing and talented. It's just a privilege to be in your presence. And this one is for you, John. Uh, I want to thank you so much for the work you did on Doctor Who. Oh. Thank you. And also, um, I'm a huge fan of Life on Mars. Thank you. So am I. And what I was wondering was, um, I wondered how early on in the series, in Life on Mars, you were aware, and I don't want to give any spoilers, um, of the reality of your character. Did you know that going in, or was that kind of a surprise to you as well? Oh, whether he was in a coma or right. gone mad or... What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they hinted that it was, it was the coma, but they didn't tell me for definite, so I, didn't, I couldn't play it and, until I needed to, and in, until I needed to be in the hotel room, uh, the, sorry, the hospital room waking up. I, I wasn't really sure either, so I think they did that on purpose, which is a, I think is a good idea. Thank you again for your wonderful work. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. Hey, what you should tell them the last night's elevator story. What? About which the, one? About the guy that said you're. A <laughs> <laughs> there are so many elevator stories. <laughs> last night's. He gets in the elevator, and uh, yeah, he's in the elevator, and um, you know, there's a lot of robots and stuff in there and stuff, and then. Chewbacca. Yeah. Yeah, was, every floor someone got on, like robot and then Chewbacca and then some alien and eventually and everybody was drunk and it was very late and I was thinking, oh, am I gonna get away with this? It was fine. And then the last people that got in stared at me for a while and went, you know, you look exactly like the master from Dark. <laughs> and I just went, Yeah, I get that a lot and left immediately <laughs> next floor. Uh, who's, uh, do you have a mi uh, microphone right here? Go ahead and stand up. Hi, this is for John. I was wondering what drew you to this part in Intruders? Uh, well, uh, all of it, really. The, I read the book, which I loved, um, and I met up with Julie Gardner, who's a friend of mine, and she invited me over to, you know, be in it, and she told me the story of it. She told me um, who they were thinking of casting, and it was just the whole thing, the whole package. I've never played an American. It was a new challenge, you know, I've done quite a lot in England and kind of, I'm not treading water, but I, w I was thinking, you know, something new would be great. And sh just then she offered this hand across the water and I was really happy to take it. So it was everything. I mean, but mainly um, the script, mainly always the script. And you know, it's just such a brilliant script. And so yeah, it was that. Great. What about uh, for James and Mira, what drew you guys to your roles and into the piece? Go no, Mira. Okay. Um, I always get nervous because I'm not allowed to tell everything about my role because there's some spoilers related to it. Um, but uh, the, the role as it goes through the series is really phenomenal. It has this huge range. Uh, I get to do things in it that I've never done before, uh, acting-wise. Uh, played certain colors in my paint box that I've never played, um, but also had really weird little challenges within the scenes where I'd be like, Glenn, Glenn, what? This line, uh, what it, I, I, I can't explain exactly what I'm saying here, but you know. And I'd I, say, just say the lie. <laughs> Shut up. No, but there would be shifts. There's shifts in the middle of scenes that I would have to consult with the writer to know exactly what was happening, because paranormal stuff is happening. And I had to be sure of what was happening. And that was such an interesting thing to do and to, to try and pull off. And then I had to do lots of dialogue in other languages. <laughs> Most of which I did not speak, uh, so that was very interesting. I finally uh, 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 I don't speak, but she speaks five languages or something. But but he chose not to include any of those in the script. <laughs> <laughs> I, I finally begged him. I said, "Look, you've got me speaking Russian here, and then I'm supposed to speak Aramaic or Polish or something. Can I please speak Italian?" And so we changed. We, we, the one little one little line is in Italian. So that I, I breathed such a sigh of relief with that. But it's just it was you know getting to work with Glenn. Um, getting to work on this fantastic script, getting to work with James and John. And you know, the crazy part is I actually worked with James on one of the very first projects I ever did, uh, The Buccaneers, which was also strangely for the BBC. Um, that was like my fourth or fifth project. Uh, it was the first job that got me out of waitressing and bartending and moonlighting. And we were babies on it, but we shot it in England and the US. And, and so we had this reunion of sorts. But you know, the whole project is terrific. When you watch it, you're going to understand, you're going to be like, oh, of course, people would say yes to this because this is fantastic. So. Well, for me, it was about um, having a really cool gun. 
And um, at the beginning, I then hinted that, that, I, that I would have a really cool gun. Um, and so when I got on set and I have a really cool gun, I felt like I can trust these people. <laughs> these are good people. Um, to me, it felt like it was a combination of all these different genres. It's a thriller, like this 70s thriller. It's that paranormal thing. It's got a lot of horror elements. Um, it's a domestic drama, uh, and it's a character-driven piece. Uh, and it's put together all in a very original way. I, I, and uh, when we finally saw it, which was just, what, a month ago, a few weeks ago, it's, it's really good. It's really good. It came off, and we're super excited about it. Um, and we're really excited for you to see it. So, um, yeah, it was fun all the way from the first read to the end. I'm getting emotional now. Uh, who's got the next question? Oh, Ray, or, do you need a microphone? Oh, we have somebody with a microphone. Who's being pointed at? <laughs> oh, right here. Hi. Um, this question's for John. With how crammed your schedule's been over the past couple of years, how has this, uh, coming onto this show, doing new accent work, doing, uh, you know, having to travel intercontinentally, uh, how does that change up your process? Oh, I, it's just something I've got to deal with. I mean, you know, it's a great problem to have, um, being busy. So um, uh, the new accent work was a ch new challenge, and, you know, ev every job needs some kind of new challenge to make it interesting. Um, so it, it didn't really affect it. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been doing it a long time. You know, I'm not great with traveling a lot and being away, but I seem to do both quite a bit. Um, and that's fine, but, you know, the family can come out, and it's, it's all good. It's, um, yeah, it didn't affect it really at all. I mean, it was, it was, I was doing this and The Village, the show in England. I was doing series two of The Village at the same time. Never again. That, w that was full on. But, um, you know, like I say, great problem to have. And there's a, yes, you're right here. Hi, I was able to, uh, they have another event here in San Diego at the same time, and uh, they screened the full episode of your show at that, so I was able to see it. And uh, I wanted to ask a Millie question because she is so incredibly creepy in it. So um, I'm going to rephrase it. What, is, what techniques do you use as an actor to work with someone who has vastly different experience than you do or comes from a different place? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's a different technique. Uh, you just sort of adjust and, and deal with whatever you're working with. And she was so, she's got such raw talent. I mean, she's so talented and it's just bursting out of her, you know. So it was, it was, it was, I don't think we had to change in any way to act with her. She was just a, a joy to work with. Millie Brown, she was wonderful. It's, it's true. She, I mean, it's incredible working with her because you're working with another actor. There's no difference. She just seems to know it all. We had a rap party at the end of the whole show, and uh, Millie stopped the DJ at one point, got up the stage and sang, a, and sang which she sang a Bruno Mars song. And we were all like, oh, is this going to be OK? You know? And she stood there, and she sang it, and it was beautiful. It was like the voice or something. And we're all just like, <laughs> she, what? It's just insane how talented. She's not a normal kid, is she? I think she actually <laughs> has been intruded. <laughs> but don't quote me on that. No, yeah, if you saw the uh, last night, there's a scene in the bathroom. And um, uh, she was doing that. And we actually had several other avenues to go on that scene, to shoot, possibly. And um, she was doing her reaction to what she did in the bathroom. And you know, I had said to her, I'm like, um, OK, I know this is really hard. If anybody can do it, you can. Your reaction to what you did. But when you cry, I have to see your face because she had been like crying like this. And I said, I have to see your face. And she goes, OK, let's go. Let's go. And, when, and you know, just like start throwing technicians out who are coming in to touch up her hair and stuff. And then you pull back, and you're watching it on the monitor. And, and you just stop making a film. You're just going, who, where? This kid's never done anything like that. Where is this reaction coming from? You know, and so it's just. Her, her, any jo, her inner Joe Pesci. That's, uh, that's, that's what's all coming from her inner Joe. Yeah, she makes so the rest of us look really terrible. That's, what, <laughs> so that's a problem. 
Uh, who's got the next question? Uh, right, right over there. Hi. Um, I think James sort of almost answered this already, but I've got the microphone, so I have to ask again. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned um, all the other genres that it's drawn on and bringing them all together into something that's original, but I was wondering where would you put the main inspirations for the show, and then what would be um, your impression of the point of difference? What, when you say it brings out something original, what is the original thing um, that is the essence of the show? Um, that's a good question. The, the, I think that for me, um, and Glenn, I don't know if you agree or not, so I'm, I'm going to put it out there. You can shoot it down. Um, I think it's all about character, and I think that the genre of a piece is almost like the background. It's, it's designed to bring you into the world of the characters so that you care about the characters and invest in them. And then it's sort of it's sort of the shape and the color of it, but, but I think that dramas are always about people and how they interact. And so, have I answered the question in any way? Almost. Glenn's going to take over. No, no. I'm. You know, I. I think what James said, and we've all seen like some TV or movies just have like extraordinary production design and is lit really well. That we don't care about the people. Um, but we've done, you know, we, we have this paranormal psychological thriller, but what we drew from, oddly enough, maybe, was uh, those movies in the 1970s that were, like, so paranoid, the uh, uh, clue and the parallax view, the conversation. That's what our lighting choices were like. But as James said, it's all about what everyone's going through. And in our show, you know, if you can live forever, should you? Or just because you can live forever doesn't mean that the next time around you're not going to make mistakes again. And so these guys are all dealing with the problems that all of us are dealing with, but in a kind of hyper real situation. And so I think that's what. Uh, yeah. Was that the was that the impetus with, that you were working off of that kind of question that made you want to go about with the project? Well, when you read uh, Michael Marshall Smith wrote the novel, and the novel there's part of it has sort of a Raymond Chandler, a wife is missing. And then you had this little girl that seemed to be possessed by somebody. And then you'd have this assassin cleaner who had made a mistake and was trying to correct it. And you'd be like, what? How did, yeah, each chapter is a different genre. And then he was able to kind of meld it all together. And we just were doing the book, you know? And those are all genres that all of us like, you know? Uh, anyway, and uh, I think we pulled it off. Yeah. Uh, who's got the next question? Oh, right here in front. Oh, oh. oh there you are. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have to say that I saw the panel last night, and this show completely blew me away. I was so excited to see the talent, and then I was like, oh, my God, I don't want this show to end. I don't even care about the talent anymore. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. Um, now, all the deep questions are gone, because now I'm going to ask something stupid, but... Um, so is this going to be a, how many episodes were filmed and is it going to be like a Doctor Who where there's like five months in between or is it going to be like a Sherlock where you do five and then we have to wait a year and a half or how's that working? <laughs> Are you just asking but, questions specifically of the BBC right now? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> I told you it was a lame question. They are here, they're question. at the back. They're up there. So uh, it's eight episodes. Yeah. Any, any yeah. thoughts? That is not enough because that show was amazing. I think you heard her, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what is the, what is the production schedule supposed to be like? How many episodes are you guys planning? Uh, we, we, or can you we, talk about we that? shot eight. Okay. I'm going back to, we're editing in Vancouver, so we're locking the fifth one. I really, you know, I really feel good about them. They're really pretty good, and um, yeah, and I'm not just saying this because those guys are back there, but it's really an honor to be, you know, the BBC in England obviously, the British brought, and BBC here, they have just such uh, a tradition of great, intelligent sci-fi, you know, and because of my background, I have to go to meetings, and they, here's a show, and you go, God, that's so dumb, and it's an insult to all of us who, I've been going to Comic-Con since the 70s, because I lived here, it's an insult to all of us, and the BBC has always made intelligent, you know, smart and so it was like uh, an honor to do this show and you know make it smart make it good for every the 
you know, all of us that come here are going to enjoy it. I can't help you with a good writing, but it's got good acting. I tell you that. So. Uh, who's got the next question? <laughs> who's got a microphone? Right down in front, right there. Um, with it being such a serious kind of show, do you have any, I don't know, humorous things that you do when you're not filming just to kind of break the tension of, of everything that you're doing in the show? Millie Brown. <laughs> was, was there. Millie Brown was there to, you know, puncture all the seriousness. Um, but no, the, the, funnily enough, usually when it's a very heavy subject matter, and I've, d I've done quite a lot of heavy subject matters, it's usually a really fun set. It's really weird, you know. And if you're doing a comedy, it's usually a nightmare <laughs> to film. But um, yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun. It was great. It was very laid back, and, you know, because of the subject matter, you know, if we didn't have fun, we'd be so depressed. <laughs> the rest of the day so it was um it was great it was great fun to do we had uh we have a vancouver actor daryl shuttersworth i think he, i think john had gone back i love daryl and uh his wardrobe had ripped and wardrobe was sewing up his pants and they were lighting him in the cop car and then the ad's like here we go and he goes no i don't have any pants no no we're rolling and so he just gets out of the cop car you know he's the detective and he has no pants and we left it in the cut, and Julie Gardner at uh, BBC Worldwide, she goes, I don't understand why Blanchard has no pants. <laughs> I go, it's just a joke. I know, but why does he have no pants? I'm like, let it go. Uh, who's got the next question? Uh, right over here. Hi. Hi. Um, this question's for James. You seem to have popped up in a lot of things that I watch. And every time I'm wondering, how is it going to turn out? And you do such a great job. What? has been your favorite role so far? <laughs> Shepard on The Intruders. Your second favorite? <laughs> Franklin Mott on True Blood. And you know, uh, it's interesting because there were elements of this character in Intruders that were similar to Franklin. Um, the main difference is that uh, my guy in Intruders is not insane, uh, and he has the story that makes sense. And uh, but he is sort of in the darker range of the shades of grey we all live in, um, and is actually a really fascinating and well well drawn character, well, well written, well done, Glenn. Um, and yeah, I, it was to be able to keep peeling the layers back and finding out who he is underneath. The sort of mask was the that was really rewarding. That was good. Who's got oh right up back there? Uh, the show looks fascinating and interesting, and I'll be looking forward to watching it. But I don't have an intelligent question about that, so I'll be watching that. But um, two questions: one for James. I'd like to hear a little bit about the story of um, it had to be interesting to be discovered by Attenborough on some level. <laughs> so there's got to be a story there. And then also I'd like to hear about um, what the kind of, if you can recognize any differences or contrast between shooting a North American show versus a UK based show. And if there are any consistent differences between the two. I mean, I think John can speak to that as well. But and for me, it always just feels like filming. I, I don't know if there's a big difference between uh, the challenges of movie and TV or American or British, it's always it's always long hours and really intense trying to do your best work and so you know, that's, it doesn't feel m different in that way. Um, do you want to say I something? I go with that. I, I just, I, you know, apart from the weather, it's exactly the same. You, you, you work the same, you know, hours and you concentrate the same and you research the same. It's, it's filming. Yeah, so not, not much difference. Just a lot more tea. A lot more teeth, <laughs> bigger budgets, you know, but yeah. Better, better craft service. <laughs> better teeth, did you say? Well, craft service is a big difference. I think there is, a, there is better teeth generally. On oh, there's American. better teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know it, but apparently it's all paid for. Um, and then to your question about um, Attenborough, it was, an am it was an amazing break that I had at the beginning of my career. I was still at drama school. 
and they would send us out on auditions, casting directors would sort of, who are the new people coming out? And I kept going back to this casting director's office, and then she said, um, I'd like you to meet Richard Attenborough tomorrow. And I was like, oh. Uh, because I didn't know who was doing it, who was in it. Um, and so I met with him, and then he, he was you know, very sweet. And then about a week later, Richard Attenborough, Sir Richard Attenborough, would like you to come to his house and uh, go to his private screening room. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Um, <laughs> You've got to keep him wanting you, you know what I mean? Uh, and then I went there and we read it, and he said, well, darling, I think the job is yours if you want it. Um, and I said, I, I do want it. <laughs> and can I call my dad? And I, and I did, I called my dad because I was so freaked out. Um, and then it was with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger, and it was like everyone had a knighthood. In fact. Uh, Richard Asimov went from a sir to a lord while we were shooting. <laughs> they, they had to change his chair back. He's a lord. I don't know what that means, but it's, it's bigger than a sir. Uh, who's got uh, the next question? Oh, right, right in front. Oh, yes, you have a microphone. Hi, I'm not going to stand because I don't know where the camera is, but um, I know John answered this a little bit, uh, before, but I'm just curious uh, out of the three of you who was cast first for the roles and if it influenced your decisions, like if you heard, oh, so-and-so is already on this project and you're like, oh, well then, maybe I'll do it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyone? <laughs> I know the secret. But I want to. That we're not going to talk about. <laughs> Who's got another question? Oh, actually, Mira, I have a question. You, uh, you told me to ask you something about William Shatner. So I'm asking you now something about William Shatner. Okay, all right, because it connects to the show. <laughs> okay, well, all right, just long story short, when I was a kid, my dad and I always used to watch, my dad being Paul Servino, I know most of you know that, but, you know, he's... He's rather a household name in terms of wonderful character actors in the U.S., but uh, he was a huge original Star Trek fan. So we used to watch the reruns. I, I was not old enough to watch it when it first came out. I was not born, I think, when it first came out, but um, maybe born the same year it first came out. But, uh, okay, we're stopping talking about my age now. Uh, <laughs> we used to watch the reruns, and uh, I was obsessed with it. I, I just loved the original Star Trek. I loved Captain Kirk. I loved Spock, McCoy, everybody. And we even got to go eat at Leonard Nimoy's house when I was a kid. And he, you know, he said to, to my dad, well, you know, everyone says they're a fan, but I, ha I have a test for you. Um, what's the name of the grain and the trouble with tribbles? And he said, Quadro Triticale. And he's like, all right, you're, you're a real Trekkie. So you know, as, I, as I grew older, I, I, I expressed my fandom by going to a couple of conventions when I was a teenager, okay? So I, I am, um, you know. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I have a phaser, I have a communicator, and I have the original action figure set with the deck. And, you know, you can put them into, like, the transporter room, and it turns around, and they disappear. Very exciting. Your nerd cred is off the charts right okay, now. Okay, okay. just, off, like, pinging right, so, the, the scale. So he was probably, I could probably honestly say that Captain Kirk was my first crush. You know, as a kid watching, watching, uh, he was my first crush. And then years later, when I was dating Quentin Tarantino, we ran into William Shatner at the Mike Tyson ear-biting fight in Vegas. And... Quentin immediately, immediately outed me to Shatner, said, oh, my girlfriend's in love with you. And I, I, I sort of died of embarrassment and sort of dropped down to the floor. And, then, and then, then Mr. Shatner reached out to me a few days later and it was like, hi, how are you? Yes, okay, but I'm, yeah, okay. And uh, then I ran to, into him a few more times over the years. At, I presented an award to them at TV Land, the whole cast, and I got to meet all of them while they were all still alive. It was incredible. It was beautiful and very emotional. Um, so... Long story short now, it's, it's very long. Uh, we get, <laughs> we get to, to the set of Intruders, and somehow I start following him on Twitter, and then I kind of reached out to him. I don't know why. I don't know how it came up. But we, Glenn and I were talking, and I was like, you know, maybe should we ask Shatner if he'd want to be involved with the show maybe next year? And so I, like, tweeted something to that effect, and he's like, wait, Intruders, is that the show with John Sim on it, the one who wants to kick my ass? <laughs> 
and, uh, and I, I said, oh, well, yes, he is our leading man. Uh, I was not aware of any unsavory history between the two of you. And apparently, there was some kind of crazy scandal about Doctor Who and someone suggesting that Shatner should play the master at some point and then the showrunner saying that John Sim would kick your ass. And, and so, so she, you know, so, uh, but anyway, then I expressed, I expressed your undying respect and admiration for Mr. Shatner. And I think everything's fine now, but I don't know, your perspective it's on fine, the fine, uh, we had the Twitter <laughs> off. But I was like, no, no, I was on my knees on Twitter. No, my God, no, I don't want to kick your ass. Captain Kirk. Jeez, um, <laughs> no, it was the, um, the, 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 People from Doctor Who said something in the, in the press. It was all the press. It was nothing. It was nonsense, really. Yes, well... It was I, very surreal, uh, having a Twitter off with Shatner. But. Yesterday, as we walked through the hallway of the hotel, the Hilton, there was a Captain Kirk shoe shine. And she freaked out. <laughs> was like, oh! And we were I, supposed to go to this interview, and she went running up to them. Sorry, carry on. Well, there was... It, I, no, it's true. There was an older man who looked quite like him, and not, not quite as handsome, but, but he looked quite like him, wearing, you know, this sort of mustard-colored, you know, uh, Federation shirt with the little insignia. And he was shining people's shoes, and I, I took a selfie with him. But um, anyway, <laughs> then I reached out to Shatner, and he tweeted back, and he was here the other day. So anyway, that's the end of the story. But there was... I'm so glad that you told me, hey, ask me about William Shatner before we walked out here. That's such a great story. I love that you're so eloquent, you use the word unsavory in it. I was like, that's very good. I would not even M thought Mustard color. <laughs> uh, we got time for one, maybe two more. Yes, right here in the front. Hi, um, just thank you guys for coming. This is so wonderful to see all you. Uh, you're so all talented. I love you as a master, and you're in Falling Skies, and you've been in everything. <laughs> and you too. Um, I just uh, <laughs> He wrote the X Files. I yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, my question is like, there's like a three part actually. Um, what is your inspiration for um, acting? And what are you guys nerdy about? And the last question is would you do smiles if you have a time? Uh, s smiles, uh, we do smiles or smiles, we do a photo booth. If you guys have the time, I, if they do, I'll work it out and we'll tweet it out and put it out on the Nerd HQ app. Sound good? Okay, cool. But until we know that, move on with the other two questions. <laughs> what are you nerdy about? And what was the other one? Um, what is your uh, inspiration for acting? Like, main inspiration? Uh, mine was um, James Dean's red jacket in Rebel Without a Cause. That was it. That was gone. <laughs> when he was on the floor playing with that toy monkey at the beginning, that was it. It was over. Everything else was over. And I wanted to become an actor. That and Billy Liar with Tom Courtney and Julie Christie. Um, yeah, they were mine. Okay, I used to have a poster of James Dean in my high school bedroom wearing that jacket, so I, I, I feel you. Uh, I think um, in terms of performances, early performances that I saw besides you know, witnessing my dad's work, um, Jessica Lang and Francis just blew my mind. I cried for 20 minutes at the end of that, and I just felt it was so powerful that it kind of rocked me. Um, and I also, a couple of plays on Broadway, Children of a Lesser God, and um, also After the Fall. And uh, in that, uh, Frank Langella played Arthur Miller, and uh, Diane Weiss played the Marilyn Monroe character. And you don't really think of her like that, but she was unbelievable. Uh, so much so that I, I became so enamored with the play that I then directed it in college, and then I ended up playing Marilyn Monroe, who was also one of my inspirations in Norwegian and Maryland. So you know, those were the early ones. Um, my, mine were um, Daniel Day-Lewis and Gary Oldman. Um, I saw both of them on stage in London uh, before I knew their work at all, before they were doing films. And uh, they were incredible. It was just breathtaking. They, you didn't look anywhere else. Daniel Day-Lewis was like, who the hell is that guy? And, and Gary Oldman was like, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> and then they started doing their first films in the uh, UK, and I was just became a lifelong fan. Um, and then the, I, w I was at um, an Oscar viewing party in, in LA, because that's the kind of thing I do. Uh, <laughs> 
on a regular basis. And um, Gary Oldman was there. And my wife said, go home and tell him, you've got to go and tell him he's your, your, his biggest fan. I'm like, I'm not going to tell Gary Oldman I'm his biggest fan. I can't do it. She said, you're in America now, and this is how it's done. <laughs> so, so I circled around where Gary was with his entourage. I stood at the bar, kind of looking over, trying to... <laughs> Was like, I was like eight years old. And then I finally just muttered, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do it. So I, I, I marched up to him and I said, Gary, my name's James Friend. I just want to say I'm your biggest fan. All that creepy stuff that you're saying, you're like, oh, no, I sound so stupid. Um, and, you know, and he was incredibly sweet about it. He was really nice. But um, that, that's also one of my nerdiest moments. <laughs> so it all ties together. Amira, what would you say you're nerdy about? I mean, clearly Star Trek. <laughs> May have explored that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, other nerdy things, I don't know. I was such a nerd in high school. I mean, I was the ultimate nerd. That's why I did Romeo and Michelle. Because, you know, once you become an actor, people think, oh, you were like the most popular and, you know, the, the high school cheerleader. And I was none of those. I was like a bookworm. I loved to read. I actually liked studying. Um, the only boys that liked me in high school that were in my grade were the Dungeons and Dragons guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I was just kind of a bookworm and studious and, and I, I, you know, I still am to a certain extent. I love to read. I don't have that much time because I've got four wonderful children that pretty much occupy my every waking moment when I'm not working. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm still an interior nerd. And, and that's why I did Romy because I, I wanted nerds to have like a sort of underdog even though she's not as smart as most nerds, but, you know, a sort of underdog champion. <laughs> awesome. I had a nerdy moment with David Soul once. I was a kid. I was obsessed you mean, with... You're meaning from Starsky and Hutch? Yeah, I was obsessed with Starsky and Hutch as a kid. And um, many years ago, and I was at a party, and I was a little bit drunk, and um, he was there, and he walked past me, and I thought, oh, my God, it's Hutch. I've got to say something. It's one of the, what do I say? So I thought, oh, what am I going to say? So I went up, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around, and I said... Uh, David, I said, every kid in every street, in every town in this country, we all played Starsky and Hutch, and I was always Hutch because I had blonde hair. And that was my thing. I thought that was pretty good. And he looked at me, and he, uh, he said, you know what? And he sort of playfully punched me on the chin, and he said, I was always Hutch, too. Yeah. Uh, guys, that, unfortunately, is the end of our Intruders panel. Can we please give a round of applause for these wonderful panelists? Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep it going for these guys. Thank you, thank you. Let's hear it one more time, one more time. Mira Sorvino, my new celebrity crush. Uh, did, was that fun? Did you guys enjoy yourself? Excellent. That's all we aim to please. We aim to please. Uh, thank you guys so much for your continued support. I hope to see you at more panels this weekend. We still have a whole bunch more. Great. Any more? Going to any more panels? Anybody? anybody? Fantastic. Uh, keep enjoying yourself at Nerd HQ. I love you and God bless you and goodbye.